This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Attention all rodeo athletes. Join us for the Cowtown Christmas Championship Rodeo in December. Over $360,000 in prize money in the historic Cowtown Coliseum in Fort Worth, December 14th through 17th. And no entry fees. Qualify using the VRQ for the Triple Crown of Rodeo 1 million cash bonus. Featured on a CBS network broadcast. To get started, go to the App Store, download the WCRA Rodeo app, and hit nominate. This is your chance to rodeo in December. Nominate today or visit us at WCRARodeo.com. Guys, another year has ticked by. Challenging year, but there was somebody you could rely on if you needed a new Super Duty pickup, and that was Bill Fick Ford. Once again, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country. You guys have seen what's going on in the car business, in the truck business. You're seeing trucks being sold for thousands above MSRP. Well, if you go to Bill Fick Ford, it doesn't matter where you are at in the continental U.S. He will take care of you. He will stand by the product and he will not take advantage of you. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the only place you can go in 2022 for a no bull discount. Bill Fick Ford. What sets Resist All apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand. These traditions are passed down from fathers to sons, from heroes to future champions. Since 1927, Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it every day. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this awesome episode of the podcast, we've got Brendan Clark. Brendan has won nearly a million dollars in the PBR. He's had an excellent career. He's from Australia, and he did a transition into a totally different industry. And to be honest, this is a very deep episode, and it gets into some really great stuff. Check it out. Hey, you know who's really good at doing uh, freaking TV? Is Sage Kimsey. Have you guys been watching him do yeah. the PBR, PBR stuff? Yeah. Like well, he's I, so smart. Yeah, he, he's very – like I said uh, – so I haven't been to a PBR event in like six years and I – because it was on over there and Luke Snyder and I were best friends, so – or are, well, still are, I guess, but he – and so I'm like – he got me tickets and we went over there and um, I seen Sage at the end of it or whatever and I was like, dude, you're – freaking good at this shit like he, well he thinks really far ahead yeah. and he's thinking about his life after bull riding yeah well but i well, mean hopefully it's a good ha- good gig for him hopefully he doesn't have to be a horse trainer <laughs> he's got uh he married the right family yeah he did he can he can make trailers for us to put horses in he's gonna be fine yeah, he'll be okay he's gonna be fine and he's smart he'll he's already got his plans i mean but he's been making deep six figures for like 10 years yeah he's gonna be really good he, he should be fine. And if he decided he wanted to really get serious into the PBR thing, he could be – Yeah. He could, he could get him 100000 for 10 years if he wanted. As far as commentating? No, just yeah. riding. He oh, could yeah. win a world title in the PBR. I think so. I think he could. Some people don't think that. You know. I, I don't know. I, I well, That was a part of me for a while, I thought. But then he's – no, he's, he's – no, he could. He's He could do it. I, he's, think, he's, he's I think he's great. Yeah, yeah, he's not getting the attention he deserves because he's hurt right nah. now, and everybody's really focused on Stetson. But yeah, well, that, that's a perfect example of how th- people forget, huh? Mm, they do. They forget how, how many world championships. Yeah, he like has. he's like he's won, he's done everything every bull rider would ever want to do, but then he gets hurt and he's not there, so now they're just on to the next one. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, those big earnings. People gravitate towards that. Yeah, true. You know, and those average championships and the five gold buckles and, you know, it's just it's just the way it works. Everything's yeah. a peak and and then there's a valley. There's a valley, yeah. You have to figure out where to go. Like you. Yeah. You, oh, you yeah. transitioned. Yep. But, yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, we, we've we been chatting for, what, 30 minutes about some good podcast-worthy shit. Yeah. But uh, just kind of introduce introduce yourself and we'll kind of get into your, your story and then we'll start – Shooting the shit. Well, uh, I'm Brendan Clark. I originally came from Australia 
with a huge dream of riding bulls professionally. Um, when I first came over here, there was no um, PBR Australia, PBR Brazil, uh, PBR Canada. Um, they were all was just one PBR, you know. And um, I came over here in I came over here in a February of two thousand and three uh, with Troy Dunn, and we flew into LA, and I didn't even. I didn't know where I was going to be staying or what I was going to be doing, but I left it up to him. He said, oh, you'll be right, mate. You'll be right. I'll find somewhere for you. And so we go to Anaheim, California, to the PVR, and he was riding. Obviously, I wasn't. So I uh, we went straight down there, and I got to watch the bull riding there, and that was the night that that was the night that Chris Shivers rode ugly of Don Kish's to qualify to ride – um, for the million dollar ride on Little Yellow Jacket mm-hmm. back in the day in two thousand and three, back in the TNT days. Yes, ah, uh, might have been OLN then, but really? yeah, I think. But anyway, so so but Troy rode that night in the short round. Troy rode a bull. Well, it was the second night, but Troy rode a bull. Um, oh, I forget that bull's name of Powder Rivers, but anyway, so that was kind of my first event, and I was like, oh, when I was there, I'm like, this is. This is where I want to be, you know. So we we you know leave there, and I ended up. Um, he was friends with Chris Cox, and um, we went to Chris's place, and I kind of become friends with Chris, and ended up staying there with Chris for a little while, and and that was that was where I stayed when I first came in two thousand and three. But I had some events to go to in Canada, so. I went up to Canada to some PBRs and I, I didn't win anything at the first one I went to. So I, most people don't really know this story, but I came to America with, I had a sponsor in Australia that was going to pay for my flight to come to America. And I had, I had about 4,000, maybe 4,000, I think if I remember rightly saved 4,500 saved in the bank. And I was, that was what I was going to have. And then this company was going to buy my, plane ticket over here so a month before i'm leaving i we we go down i had an agent at the pro, at the time in australia and because i was pretty i was relatively successful in australia and i so we go down to sydney and we go up to this uh 20th floor or some building down in in sydney and we meet with this company and they just they they decided to tell me that they didn't think i was i couldn't because i couldn't prove to them that i was going to make it they wouldn't invest. They wouldn't invest. They were like, well, we're not going to, we don't know if we're ever going to get our value of our money out of it. And I was just like, you know, I was a little bit ignorant back then. And I was like, well, that's all right. I'll just do it myself. So they didn't pay for my flight. So then I had to buy my own flight. So I've, if I remember rightly, it was somewhere around twenty five, twenty six hundred dollars $2,600 for the flight. So that took half of my got savings. About 2000 bucks. Got 2000 bucks left. So I buy the flight and we get over here and, Anyway, I end up in Texas and then I go to Canada. So, of course, we're talking – that was Australian dollars. <laughs> so when I left, when I got over here, um, half of $2,500 because it was about f- maybe 65 cents to the dollar or whatever. So I lost half my money just on the dollar. So anyway, I go to Canada and I, I pay my entry fees and I, I don't I, – I rode my bull. I think I might have been 81 points or something. Didn't make the short round. So, but I'm staying up there with a guy named Austin Beasley, who made the NFR, road bulls at the NFR, and um, is is a great guy from Canada anyway. I was staying with him, and he left to go to Australia to a bull riding, which is ironic, and I was in Canada by myself with just him and his wife. It was just me and his wife, and I was taking care of his cows for him, and I really, he was there for a day, and he showed me how to do everything anyway, blah, 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 and so... We go to. I get a ride to the next bull run. Well, I th- um, the next bull run. I think I was eighty-eight points in the long round, and I made the short round. And then I might have been. I think I was ninety-three in the short round there, and I won seventy-five hundred dollars. And I was like, I've never. I'm never going to see another poor day. I'm like, <laughs> this is so much money. But so I paid my entry fees for that. So anyway, f- sorry, rewind. So. When I went to, I go to the second bull riding, which is the one I ended up making the money at. But before that, I go to the ATM machine and get my money out. 
and I pull my entry fees out, which I think I, I remember it being three hundred and fifty dollars to enter the bull riding. And when I got the ticket out or whatever that tells you how much money you had left in Canadian, I had three hundred dollars left in my bank account. So I had enough money to not. I didn't have enough money to enter the next one. So then I ended up riding both bulls and winning seventy five hundred dollars. So I'm like, man, I'm I'm making it. But then the problem was is that I didn't have a bank account in Canada. <laughs> so I had this $7,500 check, but I had no money. So I didn't have a bank account. So I, so then I had to rush. And I guess um, I ended up getting a bank of maybe I was like Brooks. I was living in Brooks, Alberta, Canada. So I get the uh, – I go open a bank account, put the money in the account, but I can't get any money because it's got to clear and – Takes Fin- 10 days. Yeah, so <laughs> finally it clears and not, it clears right before I go to the next one. Well, then I go to the next one in Saskatoon. It's just, oh, it's saying, hang on. So then, so I win that one, but then the Tough Edelman's, Tough Edelman Challenge was on here at Fort Worth and they wrecked out 15 guys that night. So 15, they had to, they, the, because I won that event, I moved, I moved the up into, one, the, yeah. into the Challenger Series and then I got the call up to go to um, Tacoma, Washington. So I went to Tacoma, Washington. And so then I'm like, well, I don't know where, how to get there. I'm like, I said, so, but luckily there's a guy named Kelly Armstrong in Canada that was on the PBR <coughs> tour. And, um, he, I ended up getting a hold of him and he said, fly out of here and go here and we go there. And so I go there and I get bucked off, but it was cool. Cause I'm like, okay, so the second event of this, so then anyway, I'm all over the place here, but I went, I left Australia and I was just this kid with a big dream of making it. And I go from leaving Australia to two events later or three, the third event I went to was a built for tough series event. So I'm like thrown into the wolves. I was like, yeah, wow, so I didn't you even went up quick. Yeah. I didn't even know I was going, I was like, it just happened, you know? And so then the next day after Tacoma, I didn't win anything there. And of course I'm bummed, but the next day we fly back to, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I remember Owen Washburn goes there. There was a bunch of guys go back there or whatever. Well, I won that one too. And I win another $7,500. So I'm for sure I'm never going to have another poor day. I'm like, I've won this much money in like two weeks. This is amazing. Well, then I get asked to go back to the Built Ford Tough Series event. I'm still in Canada and I think I go to Baltimore, Maryland. I may have won a check there or whatever. Well, then I go back to they have one at in um, at Calgary was a was a Cody Cody Snyder was having some bull runs up there then and it was one of them a Cody Cody Snyder bull bash or something I think he called him and I ended up winning I won the long round and I ended up winning second at the event and won another seventy five hundred dollars so I've got I'm literally rolling in money I think I'm <laughs> like there's no way I can ever. I'm not going to ever be poor again. Like this bull riding thing's a pretty good deal, you know. <laughs> so, I uh, that was the start of how it went, and then I came back to then. Then after that was the last bull riding in Canada. So I came back down here and ended up living in Mineral Wells, Texas, and um, kind of riding or going in and out from Chris Cox's place, and uh, for about six months or a bit over, maybe a bit over that, and before I got my own house. But that was kind of the start of how it all all started when I came to came to America and um, I I didn't you know I didn't know it was ever going to happen that way it was just a big dream and all of a sudden it just all come reality and and then you know I got I was lucky enough to get in with you know Ross Coleman Luke Snyder Justin McBride um, you know and it, it was I kind of at that time it might not have been the best crew to be under but they were winners you know so you know it was fun so that was kind of how it all started when i came yeah yeah and and you to be i mean that you're telling a great story so just keep keep on with that story well to the really interesting yeah and then you know well then i uh you know that was some a lot of cool things that happened i i remember because you said not the best crew so well they were they're they're, of course they're the best crew they were amazing they're amazing guys they're all winners like i said i mean they're all household names now in the PBR. They were before I got here. I was just lucky enough to get in with them. And um, Ross Ross pretty much took me under his wing and said, come on, you're coming with me. And we would just go wherever. I remember um, we went and 
hung out at Tuff's place for a week or so one time and just we would just cruise around and go wherever. And then um, we – I remember one of the first events I went to was, was probably like um, – maybe I'd been on, on tour like maybe two months and we go to Little Rock, Arkansas. And when we get there, we'd, we'd been at Tufts or whatever here in Texas and we flew to Little Rock, Arkansas and Ross is like, you want to, we're going to this Mossy Oak golf tournament after this. Do you want to go with us? And I was like, no, actually that was not how he asked me. He said, we're going to this Mossy Oak golf tournament. You're coming with us. And I was like, okay. So we ended up, we're going in Tom Teague's jet. And I'm like, Okay, so Tom Teague, for people that don't know, was he's a very successful businessman that uh, came along when the PBR really needed him and he bought the TV rights for the PBR and um, really helped the PBR get on their feet and get to where they needed to go. And um, he ended up buying a bunch of buck and bulls. He owned some great ones. He ended up owning Little Yellow Jacket, um, bulls like Scene of the Crash, so many great ones. But anyway, so we ended up, on a Sunday, we, we we meet down in the lobby and we, we'd get this limo to this private airport and there's this jet waiting for us. And I, I'm thinking, like I'm this kid from Australia that's never, like I'd, I think I'd only been on three planes before in my life <laughs> until then, until I came over here. Anyway, so we go and we get on J- Tom Teague's jet and we fly to Mississippi to this golf tournament and it's just this blur of things that were so far away from what I thought was possible that I just have to had to kept on sl- slapping my face yourself, you know, like man, this is crazy. So this things that would happen that I never thought were possible, but when I think back now, I'm like, man, like how lucky I was and how cool it was to be able to be number one around them guys, but have the opportunity to come when I did. But I remember we we're in. Um, we're at this golf tournament in Mississippi, and it was a it was a Mossy Oak celebrity golf tournament that they did to raise money. I forget what it was for, but anyway. So I remember one time I'm on the phone to my mum in Australia, basically telling her how crazy this is that I'm in Mississippi and all these famous people are around here and blah blah blah. And you know she didn't really know who most of them were, but I'm telling her I'm like yeah. Um, Bill Dance is here, he's a famous fisherman and this guy's here and blah, blah, blah. And next minute, I'm on the phone on the golf cart and this guy runs and jumps on the back of the golf cart <laughs> and I look up and it's Tracy Bird, country music singer. I'm like, holy shit, mum. Tracy Bird just jumped on the back of the cart and he goes, he looks down, he's like, who are you talking to? Because he obviously, with the accent, you can hear, and I said, my mum in Australia, he goes, let me talk to her. So he, Tracy Bird gets on the phone to my mum and talks to her for like five minutes. Mind you, I had a um, one of them pay per minute phones yeah. then. So he, a go phone? Yeah, yeah, go phone. So he used up all the minutes talking to me mum on the bloody phone. But anyway, that was kind of cool. So things like that, that you just kind of like, man, this is so cool that I've gotten to do this. Um, and... You know, so it was just things after that. And then, you know, like I remember the the days of D, Del Rio, Texas. They used to, obviously, the George Paul Memorial back in the day was, and still is, is but but was like a really prestigious event to go to. And I'd never been there. And I'd heard all these stories. All, everyone would tell me about how, yeah, we fly from, I think it was that time, we fly from Nampa to San Antonio and then we get a bus and we got a whole ass to this and the cops will be there and they'll give us an escort and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, man, this is like, I, I'm trying to envision what this is really like. So the first year we go there, we leave Nampa, Idaho and we fly into San Antonio and it's, and we get this van and Michael Gaffney, the G man, Michael Gaffney's driving the bus for us. It's me and Luke Snyder, Ross Coleman, just, I think Justin might've been with us. JW was with us. Corey Rash and, um, Oh man, there was, I can't remember. There's someone else, but anyway, we're in this, but and it, and it was exactly like they said. We're like ninety all the way there. The G man's flying, like we're dry to make it because, and they're like <laughs> they're going to hold the bull riding up. I'm like, but we're late. They're like, no, they'll hold the bull riding up. The bulls will be in the chute. You just got to put your stuff on and, and get on. And I'm like, that's just crazy. So and it's true. Like you, we drove like all hell there. G man did. I didn't. And we're 
we get there and there's people everywhere just hanging over the top of that board, like that, them bucking shoots and the music. And Ryan Bingham was singing in the arena that night. Like he was the entertainment co- helping everybody. Back in away. his early come up. Back yeah. in the early things. So, which is very cool now. But he was, he was keeping everyone entertained. We get there, you just pull your gear on. And all of our bulls that were let, and there was eight of us, seven of us, I think, seven or eight of us in this little minivan thing. And they basically kept them till the second section and they just have them all loaded and we get on. And I think that day I was, I remember I re- I, I, I kicked myself because I forget this bull's name, but Mac Altizer used to have a paint bull that had down horns that was really good to ride. And I was 89, I think, that day. And I think the lowest score was an 87 that day in that whole set of our, our, our vehicle. And um, that was when I got to meet Mac Altizer and, you know, after watching the NFR for many, many years, the bad company, like you just, like the, all them cool things were very, like it's, again, I always think back of like, man, I was just a kid from Australia that, and I got an opportunity to do this. Yeah, but I mean, you you had a great career. I mean, you basically hit the million dollar mark, and you know that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it took sport. took me a while to do it, but yeah, I, when I was, you know, I, I I look back and I did all of that in the PBR. I never, I never rodeoed. rodeoed. Um, I did fill my permit one time. I went to um, Mesquite, and I I did I, the first time I first my first PRCA rodeo. I filled my permit. And um, then I never used it again. Yeah, but I filled it. So, but yeah. So, but all of my money. So, all the you know the money was from the PBR, and I know, and I am very proud of that. But um, and it was a dream. Like I said, it was a dream. Like Troy Dunn was, you know, with several other guys like um, you know Greg Potter and uh, you know Dean Pace. There's a lot of guys back in the late nineties that made it and. And we were successful, but Troy was the guy that made it all possible for us. That made us feel like it was a there was an opportunity for us to do it. And um, you know, thankfully for him, there that was what drove us all to come over here and do it. You know, well, he's so, your he's your guys' godfather. Yes, in he Australia. is. Yeah, he definitely is. He's the one that that, and he still is. You know, like now, I mean, he's still putting schools on. He's still what people look up to, and I think a lot more people should look up to his style and the way that he rode and the way he goes about things. So having somebody like that that was a mentor, I mean, I used to get to go to the gym with him every day. I used to get to, I mean, we basically lived together. We traveled together, and he was towards the end of his career, but at the start of mine, but I had someone there that was, you know, definitely had, you know, had the right frame of mind, and it was a winner, and, um, you know, you could look up to. So that was definitely really cool. Yeah, I mean, there's a few guys that come to mind in, in the sport that just give back so much, and he's certainly one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, we're seeing more and more of it now with this team, the PBR team deal. And I, I love the team thing. And I haven't followed it, and I'll be honest with you. I went to my first event the other day, and I've been I've been following it on, on social media because two of my best friends, Ross Coleman and Luke Snyder, are, are coaches of – of um, one of the teams and Luke's coaches of or is it the Rattlers? Which one? The is he Missouri, he, the uh, Missouri Thunder. The, right? Is it the Thunder? Yeah, Lightning? I think so. Yeah, Thunder yeah. or Lightning? One of, or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, and I've got there's two Australians on his team, and blah, blah. so I've been following it a little bit, but I got to go watch it the other day, and it was actually really cool. I, I was very pleasantly surprised and, and excited about seeing it because I didn't think I'd love it the way that. I, I like did. it. And it's so cool, I think. You know, so it, it it kept I mean, I've watched I've been to thousands of PBR events and watched them over and over again, but it kept me engaged in it where so I can only imagine what it does for everybody else. So that was that was really cool to see. Especially for people outside coming into the sport. I mean, that's what you have to love about PBR that maybe you just can't really love about rodeo is they invest so much in the infrastructure and changing the sport and growing it and like you just don't see it in rodeo the same way i mean you get the american and some of these other things but i mean for pbr for that one event yep no i agree they they really do a good absolutely i agree and it's and they've done it for you know they've been the ones that have changed the game for so long and they continue like i like i said i completely when it come out i'm like what the hell are they doing now because i Obviously, doing what I do now, I don't have a lot of time to follow it as much as like I used to, and and it's, uh, but it was, I think it's really cool. I do, yeah, and it just gives people something to engage with, 
every Absolutely, night and yep. every week. And, you know, it's cool. That's yep. what you have to have. You have to have buy-in from the fans. Yeah, well, I agree. And, and it's, you know, I know I, I think that that's with everything that, you know, is out there, any sport, any, any industry, I think that's the same. And, and I think the PBR has been innovators with that. I mean, they just always think outside the box and, you know, I always remember, I tell people, you know, with the, with the, the National Rain Cow Horse Association now, I always bring it up. I'm like, there was so many times when the PBR changed a rule or they changed the format or they they added money here and did whatever. And you got, like, everyone's like, this is stupid. Boy, we're not going to buy This is not going to work. And then, oh, I'll be damned. It worked. And it, not only did it work, it got better and people liked it more. They might have complained about it for a little while. But it worked way better. And, like, I think that's there's something to be said about that by, you know, changing things and, and, and thinking a little bit outside the box in everything, I think, really is what made has made them continue to be relevant. I, I think so, yeah. I mean, it has not really – I mean, there's an arguable time period maybe, just like everything where it hasn't really gotten stagnant. But they also bring – high level business people in and innovators yep. and idea people. And there's other organizations that they just don't, it's the same yep. freaking used up people yep. keeping it the same, which it's really, it's not great for the competitors. I mean, that's right. why there's a lot of disenfranchised people with, you know, I, I rodeo. I love it obviously, but with rodeo PRCA. So, yeah, that's, you know, and it is unfortunate because it, you know, it could be different, but you know, I, I honestly, I changes, Change is a hard thing. When you change anything or try to change something or, or the, the thought of change is is you, you're you like, what if it doesn't work? What if, And I think you've really got to be in that mindset of like, it's going to work. It'll be fine. Or be so desperate it's the only option. Yeah, it is the only option. Yep. Because change is like, aside from like heartbreak or lot, it's like the most painful. It might yeah. be more painful. I mean, yeah. change, it's like you got your gears going left. Yeah. And they have to just stop and go right. I right. mean, it literally feels like your soul's being sucked out of your ass. Absolutely, and you. I mean, it's just, that's scary. It is yeah, very. Scary. The unknown is, I think, what's the scary part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely, I agree. And your comfort, right? And you, I mean, you had to have experienced when you made your shift. I mean, oh. not that riding a bull is a comfortable experience, but you get comfortable to living a certain way, operating a certain way, being viewed a certain way, probably. Yeah, being a certain I, type of person. I, I I'm going to be honest with you. That was a. That was a hell, like it was a, a really big change and it was a really hard change. Um, I and I see it now and and it, and it happens with a lot of people and you hear about it in the media and blah blah blah. But I went through a period of uh, f- firstly, before I get into this, I'm going to say thank God for the National Rain Cow Horse Association or Cow Horse because if it wasn't for the Cow Horse. I don't know what I would have done when I finished riding bulls because for your livelihood, you yep. mean? No, I, well, well, just to fill that void of what you're saying, that that emptiness and whatever it is that you've got, because I felt like when I found that, I found it before I was I finished riding bulls, and I found that I loved it before I finished riding bulls. So when I was done riding bulls, I knew I wanted, well, I guess I didn't know I wanted to train horses. I just love training horses. I love the being able to do something with a horse that some people, some other people can't do or to just to make it be the best it can be. And that was what I, but then going down the fence in the rain cow horse for me was the same feeling and the same kind of adrenaline, guess, rush, adrenaline rush as riding a bull because there was so many, it was, it was unpredictable. You really couldn't control that much what was happening. Although you're trying to control the situation, you can't always control it. You've just got to try and make the best out of the situation of what you got. So that, I think, was what drew me to it in the first place. But back to when I retired from riding bulls, I feel like I went through like a, a period of depression and, and unknown and not really... Like, I, I just didn't feel like I had anything. But the one thing about me was I, I never I never thought that bull riding was my identity. Now, when I was riding bulls, it was, for sure. I was, I was, I was Brendan Clark, the bull rider. I was Brendan Clark, the Australian, the, the high, you know, highest money earner. That was me. But then once I was done with that, I was like, well, I, d- 
it's it's not my identity anymore and I don't want it to be my identity. So there was a I I struggled for a long time. Like I really did because there was like, well, there's always you've got that to be like, man, like people know me. They they know that's who I am and that's and and there's something about when you're when people know you and they think you're cool about you know by doing that that there it makes you feel better about yourself but when it's not there anymore you're like well, 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 what what am i now like so yeah i mean i can relate to what you're saying on so many le- funny uh what was it maybe 2 months ago i was with clinton at his uh up in arkansas mm-hmm. and that's a question he asked me He's like, well, where are you going with all this? What are you gonna do with this? What's the what's the end goal? And I was like, I don't really know. I just know it's my identity. Yeah. I don't know what that looks. Like. I completely relate to what you're saying. I don't know what it looks like post or how what things are gonna be. Yeah. After. And, and so for me, I really, I really struggled for a little bit with that, but then I, but then I realized that I, I didn't need. I didn't need to be – I didn't need people to know me as Brendan Clark, the bull rider. I, so then I quickly realized that I don't, I don't even want anyone. When I started doing, the, when I started doing the, the cow horse, of course, everybody – that was how everybody knew who I was and – or not everybody, but a lot of people. And, and it was kind of cool. But then I started – that was cool at the start. But then when I started being a, a little bit more successful – and I don't, and when I say a little bit more successful, I mean I started winning a little bit, and I, I could, I felt like I'm like, man, I, I can train a horse to do these three events, not as good as you know the Corey Cushings and the, you know the Todd Bergens and you know everybody else, but I'm I can do it. So then it really affected me, like in a way where I was like, I was really, I really hated the fact that anyone knew I was a bull rider. I was like, I don't even want anyone to know that I'm a bull rider anymore. Like I, it, it really, I hated it. I, it, it pissed me off when someone would say, oh, you're the bull rider. I'm like, no, I'm a goddamn horse trainer. Like, can you, I'm, I'm winning. Like I'm a horse trainer. Don't call, I'm not a bull rider anymore. So it affected me in a way that. They put a chip on your shoulder. Yes. Yep. In a way. Yep. And, and I don't mean it in a bad way where, it re- but I was like, I just, I just really wanted people to be like, yep, you know what? You can train a horse. You're, you're doing good, but it never happened. And the more, you know, the more I wanted it or the more I wanted people to think that it, it was kind of like, you know, like it affected me in a way where it really it made me mad because I'm like, don't, I'm not a bull ride. I'm, I was, and I was, yeah, I was good at it, but this is what I wanted to be really good at. So that was a period of time of that. And then I kind of was like, you know what? It's, you know, it's no big deal. We'll just keep doing what you're doing. And eventually everyone will think you do a good enough job to where you're a horse trainer now. But so then that's, that was, a, you know, it was hard because, I, you know, I feel like a lot of people in rodeo and bull riding get to that point where that, that is their, you know, like the only thing they know themselves as and, and what, everyone else knows him as is a bull rider like or a rodeo cowboy or whether you're a team roper or a I mean, bow racer or whatever it might be and and reality is at the end of the day you're just a normal person and that and those people don't actually care they don't they're, care they're, they're actually wondering what you think of them or what anybody else does yep. everybody's feeling some i mean people don't care they may care about you for that split second you're in front of your, your face or yep. that few seconds that you're doing your ride or your run down the fence. But after that, people are immediately focused on them. Yes. And that's the hardest fucking lesson in life. It's Dude. like you're constantly living a life for other people. Yep. And it's not just rodeo. It's trying everything. to make people happy. Trying to or impress like them. Trying to make them like you. Trying to, trying to fill your own ego up. It's really a, like being a human Especially today is a real messy thing. It is, and, hard. It, and you know, and it's even gotten worse with social media. But being, being a, you know, like trying to be a good human being, or being a good human being is what's important. Like, I know lots of guys that rode bulls. The guy that taught me to ride bulls, and I and, and I'm I want I'm going to get off the bull riding thing because you know that's part of what we're going to talk about, but. I think the guy that taught me to ride bulls is probably one of the best bull riders I've ever seen. And no one knows who he is and never will know who he is. And 
He's a great all-around cowboy in Australia. His name's Steve Parkinson. His nephew now is actually on Luke Snyder's team. It's on the tour now. On yeah. the tour now. But, like, and, and it's okay. Like, and I, and I, you know, that the more I realised in life, if you know, it's okay if people don't know who you are and it's okay if people don't think you do a good job with a horse or it's okay. It's a benefit if, if yeah. you can, if you don't internalise it. Yeah, because, it, but because what it does, it actually makes it worse. It makes you think that, you know, it might make you think you're better than you are or it might make you think, man, I've got, now I've got to live up to that. Like, oh, now they all think I'm good. I've got to live up to that. But reality is, is like, you shouldn't have to. Like, you should just, you, like, just enjoy the ride, man. It's this freaking... A, a side note, but can, can you, like, while we're sitting here, think of the most, like, miserable person you know? Like, most unhappy or miserable person? Oh, like, yeah, I might know a couple of them. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, if you like, if someone, when somebody says that, somebody comes to mind. Yeah, you, it does. You never say their name. No, which is crazy because you're like, they're, they're up there, right? I don't want to be that. You're like, man, I don't want to be like that. But they're up there. Yeah. They, they have that perceived success right. and that perceived yep. vision, like from other, or what you would assume, like other people think. Yep. And they're the most miserable sops yep. ever. And I think, you know, there's, we've, you know, I think it needs to become more and more. Um, it should be publicized a little bit more, and I think we need to talk about it more. And I feel like you've talked about it on the podcast because I've listened to a lot of them, and and I I do love it. But I feel like in the industry that I'm in now, like you know, as a rodeo cowboy, you have typically got your own horse, your own rig, your own money, and you you're on your own dime. You you you're your own critic. But when you start training horses for the public and other people and people come out, maybe you're lucky enough to get people to buy your horses and you're training a horse for somebody else, there becomes a whole new level of pressure, not only on yourself, from yourself, but from maybe the owner as well or the owner's husband as well or whoever it might be. So then that changes the whole gaming a lot. And I really think that... I think we need. I think a lot of people we need to talk a lot more about what effect that has on people. You know, that's. I mean, that's one of the reasons that this show exists, and I think the reason it's been so viral and so big is because we do. That's, and, and there's no outlet. It's like, and I've said this on probably a thousand freaking podcasts, but the value that you get from, and I think I just said it was Zane because he said something kind of existential and kind of you know, emo like he would, which, you know, is like, there's like, there's nothing really inherently valuable or whatever about this. Like, ah, that's wrong because so many people want to be a Brendan Clark or a Zane or, or anybody. And like, they're getting their inspiration and, and, and how to operate in the world from us. Yep. They right. actually are. It's like, where is that? Well, it's coming from this type of thing. Right. It's like you literally these, these problems that the entire horse industry misses because it doesn't get the same coverage or same attention, even as the PBR. Right. There's a lot of value in these conversations and like working through this existential crisis type shit that some kid might listen to it and they're going to be like, thank God Brendan said that. That's going to stick with me. I mean, you remember shit that stuck with you your whole life. Oh, that you, principles absolutely. you live by just that somebody absolutely. you admired said. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. And you you can, I bet you, you can remember stuff that people have said to you and you're like, when they said it to me, it didn't make any sense or I didn't really listen. But then one day it's like, oh man, if I'd have just listened to that, you Save know, yourself a lot of pain. Absolutely. But, you know, and, and honestly, I think it's a, it is a, we're going through a, a period of time now in, in life and, and the way that the world's going that we, you know, you, there is a lot of pressure from other people, whether it's social media. I mean, anyone can, can look at a picture or a, or a comment or whatever it is or something you put on social media and they can hammer you on it. Like for no reason, they don't know what, what it is they're talking about. They don't know who you are. They don't know how much work you've put into it. But they're very quick at doing that and that can have a massive effect on people. Well, think about just a few years ago, pre-social media. Like, what was the exposure that, that a top-notch horse trainer could get? You know, a couple yeah, magazine maybe articles? Maybe it was in the Quarter Horse News. Quarter Horse or, News. Or, or, or the big one might have been. Western if you, Horseman. If you could get in Western Horseman, and, and you were doing it. And that's it. So people could see that, read that, make that judgment, but you had no idea what they were saying about right. you. Now they can go right to Brendan Clark. Yep. Fuck you. I don't yep. think you can ride a horse, you right. bull rider. Yeah, you or, yeah oh, exactly. you suck. And yep. then you really you're like, fuck, maybe I do suck. Yeah, you know? right. And, and, and it well, screws up your life. I'll tell you what, if you... Uh, at the wrong time and the wrong the, if things are going bad yes it can have a massive effect on people and we've seen it yeah i mean 
we I don't know if you watched it, but just this afternoon where um, Double G, like, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, that maybe one of the greatest guys. I mean, I only met him four or five times and was the nicest person I've ever met. It was always really cool. And, and you know, it was – it was it, it, Whatever it was that he was going through, it ended up being now, too and much for when him. When you reference, just say their whole name in case somebody on the show doesn't like listening doesn't know who it is. Yeah, so Gary, Gary Gonzalez, you know, Double G just it took his, you know, took his life or whatever. And you meet the guy; he's the nicest guy in the world. He's so amazing. It, I mean, in the cutting world, everyone wants to get their horses to work like his and all that. But like. And I'm not saying this is social media that did this, but 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 pressure from everywhere just made it re- think that it wasn't worth living. Worth living, like, and 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 and, I, and, and I, I, we need we need to have like there's got to be some way that we can help people with that. And I know you've done it, and I know that you've talked about people, and and it's coming out more. And and that's what I t- I talked. I I never talked about the depression. I never talked about what I was going through when when it, through the change and. You know, you, you go through it through the change, but then you start going into a different industry where you, you're not very good. You suck. I was a terrible horse trainer. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had to learn. But I was the one thing about me was that I was, all, I was always okay with not being very good, and I was always okay with someone telling me that I needed to do better. So I never went in there with that thought process of, I'm, I'm already great, and... They can't tell me what to do, and I'll work out how to do this, and I'm going to beat them all. That was not the way it went. Like that is actually as far away from the truth as what it really is in reality. And there's guys, there's people that have done this their entire life, trained rain cow horses, and whether it be cutters or rainers or whatever. But in my industry now, the rain cow horse, there is people that have been in this their entire life that have not had a lot of success and have worked very hard at it. And that is not because they're not great trainers. That that is because it's so damn hard. You need to have such good horses and you've got to have so much dedication to do it because the hours, as you know, as a horse trainer, it's it's ridiculous. So you have all of that pressure going on you. You're trying to learn. You're trying to be better. You're trying to have the horse as great as it can be. You're trying, trying to, to eat and you're survive. You're trying to eat and survive. And then on top of that, you've got, whether it be an owner or a, and I don't have this problem. I'm not. This is not. But I'm just saying, you might have an owner, or you might have some other horse Everybody trainer's wife talking shit. Everybody knows somebody who's got a some, tyrannical yeah. owner who makes their life miserable. Yeah. that they're too afraid to give up. Yep. because they don't know where they. Well, because can you're like, them. well, I can't do. I I can't do it without them. That's bullshit. Because you can, and no one deserves. No one that trains a horse for a living that is good at what they do. Who des- does it? Who, who actually who, does who the does job? It, who does the job? Deserves to be hammered on for not winning on a horse or having success on a horse because every single person that I literally have lived it for the last three weeks, everybody there is working their ass off and they are up at all hours of the night and I'm the lucky one. You would, Maybe I'm unlucky because I don't have that many. I had two futurity horses this year. I could get over in three hours. I was done. Some of them, some guys, like the Justin Wrights and the Kelby Phillipses and um, Corey Cushing <laughs> or that, you know, Zane Davis, they've got four, five, six, seven, eight horses. The Dawsons, Sarah and Chris Dawson, they have, like, them poor buggers are up all damn night and half the day again. Some of them are trying to be parents. Some of them are trying to be husbands or wives. Like, and it's like, man, you've got, you really, like, people really have the you know audacity to hammer them because they didn't win on your horse or they made a mistake on your horse like it's it's crazy like it's so hard and i think i don't think people think about the effect it has on people by when they do that hey old son if you're not wearing rock and roll denim then you ain't no cowboy i'm dale brisby the greatest bull rider ever to live and i'm known for keeping it 90 and I keep it 90 because I'm wearing rock and roll denim with reflex technology. They give me the flexibility I need to get that knee up. My biggest problem is I get an earache because I get my knee up so high, I kick myself in the ear. That's why I'm the greatest of all time. It's because of rock and roll denim, old son. Get you some. Well, so there's so many psychological things you just went into right there. Like, you could go down a, 
three hour rabbit hole just on Did that. we get deep? That's we got, deep. We got pretty deep. That is deep, but it gets even deeper. Is you have to think about these horses. Right. I think about this all the time. And the kind of person who can afford to put that horse in your hand, what do they do for a living? They're the fucking boss, right? Yeah, they are. Of whatever they are. they're doing. They're used to doing this and whatever they want done gets done. That's their right. They achieved whatever they achieved. Yep. That's cool, but it's a different. They can buy it. They can buy it. Yep. But they can't do what the trainer can do, which is no. why they have the trainer. And, like, there needs to be an element of respect for that. I understand people, they want to own great horses because, right, you might have a, a Fortune 100 business, a right. $100 million, $200 million company, and that's great. You yep. did that. But you're coming over here, and, and you need this trainer. They don't work for you at the same capacity one of your W-2 employees does. Right. And I mean, I've done both. I've trained horses. I've employed plenty of people, like in totally different things. I've worked for people. I've worked for myself. I get a, a tons of attention for hosting podcasts. Get no attention at all for, you know, riding a three a two year old. Yep. And like there, there's so many different things that a person of power has going through their head about themselves that it's very tough for that type of human. Yep. Like through throughout history too. To not try to subjugate somebody, right? Yeah, no, I agree, and and it is, and, and look, I'm very, very, very lucky. I have the greatest customers in the world, and we're very small. We keep it smaller. We don't have a lot of customers in our new business, and um, you know, we're very lucky. They are very, they're very supportive. They're very much team players, and they very much get the game. Um, but I feel like on our, you know, on this subject, where where it's it's part of our job to educate them on you know, how how it, you know, may or, or it should go or, or maybe how it's going to go. But there's one... Set the expectation. Th yeah, right. And it, But, it, you know, there oh, it happened to me this week. I haven't, you know, like our newest customer, they're great people. We had a horse we, we went and bought and, you know, their first futurity and every single thing that could have gone wrong with that horse, as in... In each of like the three events, something went wrong somewhere along the line in all three events that you're like, man, what else could go after the first song? What else could go wrong <laughs> after this herd work? Damn, what else could go wrong after the fence work? Like, we flipped over last night, fell like endoed over the top <laughs> of a cow last night, and it's like, man, that that just explains to you how our futurity's gone. It's hard to educate someone about that because we all want to win. We're all out there trying to win. We're all out there trying to work. But you know what I'm what I'm very fortunate about is, and I don't think everybody else has this, and I, I know they don't. But I'm very fortunate that when when we're there at three o'clock in the morning working, and we're still there at you know nine o'clock that night, that our customers are like, man, what the hell? You you guys work harder than anyone we've ever seen before. And like these are people that make a lot of money you know so they recognize it but then on the other hand there's also people that are like man we own you you do whatever you, you're going to do what we we don't have anyone like that because i i learned this from it was very hard to make the decision but i learned this from clinton and it's like you know we can't the the stress you're that that comes from that is not worth what the money you're making because like we're all we're all we're, we're either all in and we're a team player and you 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 get you take the good with the bad. It it just comes from your own self vision, right? right? And, you, and the worth right. that you find yourself. Like, yep. do you, do you think you are more valuable as you stand than the money you stand to make from that person? Right. If you don't, then you haven't quite figured stuff or, out. Or yes, you're right. You're a hundred percent right, and I agree with you. Or how about this one? That's so simple. Do you deserve to be res disrespected like that? Or you know, how do you feel like you should be treated? Take the money out of it. And we all should be treated like, and I've been a culprit of it. I've treated people badly over the, over my lifetime. And I, 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 I wish I never have. And I've always tried to say sorry. And we've all made mistakes and everything like that. But reality is, is you know, at the end of the day, money doesn't really mean it. It's just been like being, respect everyone. You know, like be respectful to the person that's actually trying to help you and do the best they can. Yeah, you know, like but you, you as a as, as the horse trainer, like you, you have to operate as an entity, not right. an employee or an individual. Right. You have to operate as a venture capitalist and an entity, just like Clinton says. I mean, he's right on the money. Oh, of course, literally. He is. I mean, he's he's from Australia, broke to to. 
he could hire trainers if he wanted. Yeah. And, but you literally, um, you know, you should never say you should do this, but it's like, hypothetically, if you're in a position where your self-respect doesn't outweigh that dollar and what they're going to give you, then you've got a big problem with right. your life. Yeah. You're it doesn't right. matter how great of a horse trainer you are or, or anything. I mean, look at, I, my wife and I, we just watched that Tyson on Hulu, yep. the Mike Tyson show mm-hmm. that they did a little docu series where it would kind of dramatized it. But I mean, look at what that guy let all those promoters do to him. He let promoters steal three hundred million dollars yep. from him because he just would didn't have enough self respect. His self talk the whole time was, "I'm stupid. I'm I'm worthless. No one loves me. So I'm gonna let Don King steal three hundred million dollars. I know he's doing it, but I'm gonna let him do it." Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's I think. <laughs> As much as we all hate to say it, but I think we've all been in that in a small way. We've probably all been in that way somewhere in our life. It doesn't From matter whether survival standpoint, yeah, of course. Certainly. Because you know, it's hard because I think what we do is we allow the thought of, well, this is so important to us. This is all I'm going to do, and I want to do this, and I want to be successful at it. So, so what we do, we're like, well, we're willing to give. We're going to give a little bit here. Like if someone's not treating us right, we, you know, I'll deal with them treating me not right because if they buy a horse for me or they let me have horses or they raise horses or this or whatever it might be, that I'll that deal with whatever. Is worth yeah, it. I'm like, man, I'll have a horse for next year. Reality is, it's me. And it's like, and I've, it's happened. I mean, my, it's just, it, yeah, it's happened. It's happened to me. Like I was, and it was a big learning experience, but it's like, man, you, when they when it when it starts happening when you're you get a sick feeling in your stomach every time you get a text message or you get a sick feeling in your stomach when you get a phone call that's that's not healthy no. you know and and you've got a you know and obviously you're not happy about it so and and unfortunately i you know i've got a i've got a buddy that i you know trains horses and I, you know he him and i used to sit down and and have a that was our therapy as we used to sit with each other talking about the stupid shit that our freaking, you know, that per- single person that was doing that to us was doing. And we both thought that we had a new story that was better than the next one. And we could either, always outdo each other all the time. And it's like, man, we both, and now we're both, you know, moved on from that. And um, we're both very, it's funny now, we're like, well, what have we got to talk about now? Nothing. We don't have anything to talk about each other. Like, oh, how's your horses doing? You know, like, because we don't have any, you know, stories of like, man, they did this to us or they made us do this. And it was funny. Like, I thought I was the only one. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of people that are. And, I, I, you know, unfortunately, I feel like, and this is not a dig at people that own horses or buy horses, but what I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to get across is, is that I think it's very important to, consider what the horse trainer goes through and what he's trying to achieve and how much work he's doing to achieve the goal that we all want you know and that's that's pretty much the thing and then you know when things don't go bad trust me there is nobody that it affects more than the guy that's on his on that horse's back at that time absolutely that, that i don't care what anyone says if that doesn't if it doesn't go good when you're showing no one affect, it affects no one more than the than the trainer, the guy that's on his back. Yeah, whether he's in the level one or he's the highest guy earner in the in the industry in whatever industry it is, it, it affects us. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it it triggers those same senses of of loss and failure, and like I mean, mm-hmm. it just it fucks you up. Yeah, it does, man. It's and it's suck. We're all probably trying to be better at it, but it's hard to be hard to think like that. That it doesn't really mean anything, but it does. Yeah. We well, all got pride. And, and I think it's so important to like put that out there. Cause I think a lot of people, everybody feels that way. Yeah, of course. It doesn't like, even matter what the discipline, but nobody wants to talk about it. So that's why I'm so glad that you guys come on this show and just lay it out and put that, put that out there. Cause it, it will affect change when you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people over the course of a year that listen to this yeah. stuff. Well, you know, I, it, it I, does just, something. Just as an example, this last week, I mean, we're we're here in Fort Worth like, with a snaffle bit for charity, and I had a really good shot on. I had two horses. I had a really good shot on one uh, at the end by the fence work, and well, I, you know, it, it I had a cow hit me hard and knocked the horse and almost over and ran like went under his under a neck and took us out of it. My my owner, instead of being mad 
she wasn't mad at me. She wasn't mad. She was so disappointed. She was so, because in in her mind and in her heart, she thought she's like this is this is his chance. This is it. This is his chance. I, he's got. He's finally gonna have a chance to do it. So so she did. She did like I did. We all do. We were like, man, we're close. We're champ. We just need to do this, and we're good. So so, like I say, I'm lucky because. I have the person that's supporting me, that's backing me, that's that's on my team. That's like, man, she was so mad that it didn't work out. Not for the reason that, you know, she lost money, she spent all this money, she owned the horse, and the two things that were important. She was that I didn't make it. That that was what she was like, man. I'm so, that affected her the most. And is the horse okay? And really, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yeah, I mean. Is the horse fine? And are you okay? Or do you, you know, mental, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Are you okay that you screwed up and you didn't make the finals? Right. Well, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, yeah, I'm bummed, I'm bummed. But I was equally as bummed for her because I expected, and I was like, man, I wanted it so bad for them. Because it's like, you know, I want it for all of my clients. I want it, it doesn't matter whether, whether the horse that – was out of it in the first go, whatever. Like he wanted so bad for all of them that it if again it affects you. Like it's like you put pressure on yourself. You try to make it's it the a best. It's really you can. high stakes game, and it is, and that's why it's like just so important to have these conversations because you know there's so much there's so many eyes on other sports and things like that. But I mean the things that are dealt with in the equine industry. It's so high stakes. It's such a limited amount of time, especially in what you guys do. I mean in any fraternity. Or yep. derby, any of that. I mean, it's a one shot deal. Absolutely, it's and a one know, shot and, and for yeah, that horse. So ever. many, so many things. Like you, you are so like you know. You're like, man, is if I don't do good, are they going to take it somewhere else? Are they going to send it to another? Well, firstly, that my answer to that is, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. So it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Really, they probably don't want to be with you if they're going to send it somewhere else. So they're not on your team. And I and like I say, I'm very big on that. I'm like, you got to win, lose, or draw. Like. I've, we've had such an amazing our, our me and my crew and my soon to be wife and my help and my owners and we've had such an amazing year we've won and we've won a lot and it's but we've also lost and and we and when we ride it all together it's good it's bad it's good it's bad peaks and valleys like you said before but there's never a lot of emotion in it like there's no blame you're not you know, and that's what we try to keep out is like there's no blame. We ever, I mean, it's no secret we all work our butts off every single day. So, but, but there is other situations in I, that I hear about and and I've dealt with that that does happen. And I like I say, I don't think it comes out enough. I mean, I'm not afraid to say it. It doesn't. It's not going to affect me. Like, you know what? If nobody, if if I can't. If I don't do a good enough job and you don't want to send me a horse and you don't think we care more about your horse than anyone that's ever cared about horses, which we do, our feed programs are the best, we have we have enough vets, about like everything we work hard at, if that's not good enough for you, that's fine. Go somewhere else. That's perfectly fine with me. And you know what? If I don't have any horses anymore, damn, I drive past the goddamn Starbucks all the time and their freaking salary these days <laughs> is off the charts. So maybe we'll have to go do that, you know. <laughs> but like it, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not really probably going to do that. I'll drink the coffee though. But no, like it's you got to kind of think of it in a way where, you know, like it, it doesn't, it shouldn't, shouldn't define you. You're not doing a bad job. Every time you you fail, you're not really doing a bad job. You, you've done the best you can. Like everyone makes a bad decision. You you cue a horse or pull a horse the wrong way or you step past a cow the wrong way you do, or you miss a lead change or you, whatever the hell it is. I promise you there's guys there that have done it a hell of a lot more than I have and they're still fine. So I'll be fine too. You know, that's the kind of – and you know what? They always put a new horse show on. There's another one on. They always make new ones. They add more horse shows. so they we can go more money to the Add more shows, money to yeah. them so we can just go to the next one. Yep, that's kind of the way it's got to be, you know. Like, and and I kind of make the joke like we're we're just glorified cowboys, uh, you know. That's all we are, glorified ranch hands. Yeah, that's pretty much. That's what, it. That's every all, all of us, this. Rodeo, all of us. Cow, everything is just some version of what you're doing. Some guys doing on a ranch, right? And you've you've just 
decided to try and refine it a little bit better than what that guy who's happy to still work on the ranch. That's all we are. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, yep. and we're still hum- human beings. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the, the main takeaway is all human beings. We still happen to wear cowboy hats mm-hmm. here and there. Exactly. But mm-hmm. it's still, it's still valuable because the, the thing about it is so many people strive to do it. And I don't just mean, Raining cow horse. I don't just mean rodeo. I mean all of it. Which is good, right? Because it is good. You, you and I have been kids before, and the reason we wanted to do it was because of someone who represented it the right way and made it feel like it was a cool or great or fun thing to do. Yeah. And I feel like that's what all our job is, right? Um, it's a holding place for the next generation, but everybody's so freaking selfish. They don't even think about the next generation. Right. But that's it's, why, like, people my age, like, and I don't know how old you are, Brendan, but like, my parents, your parents, whatever. It's like a lot of the things that, or grandparents, a lot of the shit that they are trying to tell somebody that's my age, 30, or him, 24, or her, 27, you guys has, that no, young? has no bearing on, that we just make you feel bad? Man, come on now. So I, I was actually right. I was really into what you were saying right yeah. then, but then you took lost it. Lost it. No, nah. like, nah, that's episode no, over. I get what you're saying. But it's you know, true. a lot of the advice they're going to give you: save your money, do this, yep. buy a house. Like, grandma, your house. First of all, shut the fuck up, grandma. Yeah, not my grandma. Your house cost fifteen thousand dollars. Your house was fifteen thousand. Yeah, your your whole ranch was a hundred thousand. Yeah, Don. Yep. Don, shut your fucking mouth, Don. Yeah. Do you know how much it costs for me to get a 10-acre ranch right. in Weatherford? One point five million million. Yeah, I know. I get, what? No. Like, I'm sorry. We can't have a conversation about how to operate because right. you operated in a different world. I, your yeah. horse costs 1500 If I want a good horse to compete on, it's going to cost me a minimum of $250,000, $350,000 to play if, in your If somebody now. says they have a horse for $1,500, now you're like... That's a donkey, son. That's got, yeah, you, no, you don't have a horse. Yep, that's not even a horse. Yeah, you, you literally have a picture of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's it's true. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit older than you guys. Not much, but a little bit older than you guys. But depends on how you count much. Yeah, right. Well, so with the Australian exchange, we might be, the, you know, we're close, but no, it, I think you're 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 right, and and it is everything's changing. It's it's kind of like the whole thing, you know. I have a I have a little boy, he's, not, he's eight years old, he's turning nine in February, and, you know, the phone. The phone thing's a very hard thing for me. Like, I'm on the phone all the time too, but having him on the phone, I'm like, and I find myself going, I'm remembering when I was a kid, like, I loved going outside and riding and, and whether that was, I, whatever it was, I was riding my, my bicycle and, or, or motorcycle or whatever it might be, but being outside, well, Today, it's a little bit different. I mean, they're more inclined to want to be on their phone. And now I'm not saying every kid, but a lot more kids, right? So I want to be like, you know, God damn it, get out there and do whatever. But I've also got to understand, you know, like, it's shit, really hard. That was to do my, that. my, my mum and my mum and dad in Australia. God love them. They're, they're the greatest. They don't even know how to use the phone hardly. I mean, my kid can do more on the phone than what I can. I mean, I, I mean, calling him here and we're on FaceTime and he's bringing up all these little emojis and doing all <laughs> kind of thing while we're doing it. And I'm like, dude, how are you doing that? What's go- what are you doing? And he, you know what I mean? And, and he's he's eight and he knows more about it. So it's just the way the world's going. Does it freak you? It freaks me out with my my son too, because I mean, I know I'm younger, but I mean, I had a kid when I was 21. Right. That's what made me grow up quick. Yeah, well, good but, for uh, you. Yeah, but uh, he's eight, too, and it's like just a couple of days ago, I took him to ride with me. I was like, all right, you're coming with me. Get off that freaking iPad. We're going out. Right. And I was like, I put a bucket on the steps around the round pen. I was like, okay, I'm going to, because he's not giving two shits about horses. Not not even a, not even care. He's like, nah, I think I'm allergic to them. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, you might be, but you'll get unallergic if you're around them. That's what happens. The hives will go away. Toughen up. And, uh. He just wants to play his iPad. Yep. He does good in school and all that. Yep. But it's like, all right, I stuck, uh, there's a bucket sitting on the stairs so you can see over because we have this round pin that's completely enclosed and it's like 12 feet tall. Horses can't see out. It's it's a pretty nice round pin actually. But, you know, we have stairs so people can actually see you ride the colts. And uh, so I'm working her in the round pin and she's bucking and snorting. It's a two-year-old and going crazy. And I look up, I'm like, he's going to be loving this. I look up, 
he's gone. He's gone. Not even interested. Not even interested. Doesn't even care. I was like, I thought you wanted to to learn how to be a cowboy. And he's like, huh? I, he's like, I said that. <laughs> I was like, this conversation's over. The, the our world is going to end in one generation. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it. Yeah. I, I, I think we'll be okay. It'll just be a hell of a lot different. I mean, I'm yeah. sure there's still going to be kids that are wanting to do that. And there is. I mean, there's a lot of kids that want to be cowboys. And, there is. You know, last night, speaking about that with kids, I mean, the NRCHA put a thing on last night. It was, it was a duck cutting. So they brought a bunch of ducks in and the kids were on their stick horses and they made a little little pen and they were cutting. Well, I was like, man, I said to Spud Sheehy and I'm like, this to me could be the goat roping of the, of the USTRC. <laughs> I was like, could you imagine if all these kids that are around these shows, if you had every night that they they, they was, this was what, they won money or they jackpotted a dollar here or whatever, how many of them would get into it? I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's like, at least it's given them something to damn do. Like Other than, the other than sit on their phone or watch a movie on their phone or whatever. I mean, it's very good. I actually had the, conversation with someone last night that our shows are very good with the kids they, they do a very good job of keeping the kids doing activities and things like that um you know but giving them something else to do other than just that but they will there's you know you see the kids driving golf carts around and riding their scooters around and doing things like that and horses riding they all get together and ride their horses around and stuff but i feel like Sometimes we play into that, like, oh, well, just the phone's fine, or, well, there's nothing we, else. We use it yeah. as a babysitter right. so we can do what we want to yeah, do. Yeah, of course. Which, you know, how did our parents do it? They didn't. Oh. We were just there. Oh, they did what they wanted to do, yeah. but they just expected us to stay alive. Yeah, right. I mean, it would be, be at rodeos, and you might not see your parents for eight hours. And You'd be at a fraternity. Fine. We'd be at a fraternity somewhere, and I don't even know how we got food. I don't even remember. Like, I just remember we'd be in Guthrie at Lazy E, and I would be covered in mud head to toe with, like, a bucket full of tadpoles or something from that creek that's behind Lazy E. It might not even be there anymore. I don't know. I've never paid attention since. But, and just, I mean, I didn't see my parents. You were fine. Fine. I went to, wait, I, I we're thought, too scared that they're going to get human trafficked. I mean, my yeah. wife, forget it. Like, that, she is a helicopter. She's yep. like, they're going to get human trafficked if I take my eyes off of them for 0.5 seconds. That's it. They're going to be in. They're going to be in, in, in Mexico somewhere, and they're going to be in some terrible show with a donkey. That's well, what's <laughs> happening. If I well, take my eyes off of these children, well, they're going to be in Mexico. Well, I took my boy to a show this year in California. It was his first real one, you know. And I was like, I know, bud. Here's twenty bucks. You, if you're hungry. Go to the, you know where here, you know where this little snack shop is. You go to the snack shop, you order whatever you can read, whatever, you get whatever you want, and keep the money. But just remember, you only get twenty bucks, you know. So, but you're fine. Here's your scooter. Here, you do whatever. We're going to be either here or here. Like this is this, you know, Paso Robles, uh, California, very easy. It's not. No, very you wouldn't far, do but, that at Will Rogers. No, probably. you wouldn't do it at Will Rogers probably. But um, you then know, again, it was, they have that fan. So yeah, maybe. it was like man, and he was. I mean, he he was like, wait, I can do my own thing and I can go and get my own food. And one point he went over, he was cold. I was like, go over there to the thing and ask him do they have any gloves. Buy some gloves. You got 20 bucks. So he went over and bought himself some gloves and whatever. And like, it it was like, he just kind of had this like, oh, like I can be a bit of an adult, you know, and whatever. And I, I could see a difference in him, you know, not that he's he's not allowed to be like that and he's made be a certain way, but that's how we were. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I was, I was 11 years old. I, I didn't remember, get 20 bucks, though. I started, no, true. It was more like, well, back then we didn't yep. need 20 bucks because no. you could have five bucks and get whatever no, you No, you wanted. could go to the concession stand at an event and you could get a hot dog and a Snickers bar and a, a soda drink, yeah. and it was three. Yeah, hours. I know. So you didn't need it that much money, you know? So, But it was funny how we, you know, like back in the day, I, when I was, I started going to rodeos, like I grew up in a rugby league family, in a rugby family, right? So that's all we, my dad played rugby, was very successful. Um, and I, I grew up playing it too, but when I was... I started riding when I was six years old at ro- like riding calves. And then I, so I started going to rodeos when I was eight. By the time I was 10, I was traveling all around Australia with other people, not my parents. So they would just take me to someone, someone's place who was going to a rodeo and you'd go wherever. Well, I was 10 years old. They just give me, and back then, I mean, as long as you had 30 bucks, you were fine for the weekend, you know. 
I couldn't imagine that now. Like it, my boy, even though I'm like I'm like thinking I've lived it, I'm like, man, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't just be like, hey, you go with this guy and you're gonna go to Washington. It's just a different world. Yeah, but I mean, gosh, you think about that. And I don't talking about our childhood, but I mean, I would just that so many knew so many more people than my kids know. Yeah. Because I would just be at someone's house or at someone's yep. ranch or someone like and you remember when you were a kid, people yep. would give you things yeah. and they'd do stuff for you. Yep. Like I remember being at a, at horse shows on the East Coast and like one of these horse trainer guys, he's like, hey, you really like hunting. Here's a bow and arrow. Let me go buy you a blowgun. Like, hey, yeah. you need something? Like, hey, here's a BB. Like, nobody does that anymore. Nobody does anything. Like, there's no community. I, Maybe I they do. It's, I just don't see it. It was like I was I was literally raised by all the adult rodeo people in Australia because I was the kid that was there and I wasn't – my parents wanted all of them. They were at some of them, but they wanted all of them. And it was like you were there with this person and they took care of you and you, you know – that was what they what happened back in the day, and it's, it's a hell of a lot different nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I get messages on Facebook all the time from people that apparently knew me when I was a kid, and they see the show like, "Oh, we're so glad I saw you when you were just a little boy." Or I've had guests come in here that that I mean, know who they are, but I forgot that they knew me when I was when a kid. Yeah. Who was it? It was, I don't know. It was somebody. Some barrel racing lady. I don't remember who it was. It might have been Donna K. Rule or something. She's like, oh, I haven't seen like really seen you since you were a little kid. I was like. Martha Wright, that's who it was. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, firstly, like, really? that yeah. they remembered you. Yeah. You must have somehow had an effect on Oh, I was you. I was one of those kids, dude. I would get in people's shit. Yeah. I would sell them hand-drawn photos and like be in their trailers and like asking them like annoy like I, if I would have been I would have been like you get away from me, you stinky little so shit. So you were destined to do this. So destined to mouth off maybe. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mate, you you were destined to did to greatness of Spreading the word of something. Something. Who yeah. knows? Greatness is one of those words that I don't like to use, but uh, yeah. I hey, mean, man. No, this is great. It really is. I hope it does you should be, something. You should be very proud of yourself for what you've, what this is, what you've created here. I mean, I know it's not only you, but, and you've got a, a great team, but I mean, it, that's what it takes. You know, you got to, you obviously it, had it, a vision. It, it's a, it's a village. So, dude, wait, I, I was going to say this. So, do you know when no one had podcasts? I had a podcast. Do you, you know that? You were doing one? I yourself? was doing. So in about 2000 and so before anyone had podcasts back in. So one time, now we're on the podcast thing, aren't we? So one time, remember Joe Rogan. So Joe Rogan had started his podcast. Joe Rogan started his podcast in when I was in high school. Right. And that's how I found out about podcasts. So that was what me too. This is like, okay, I'm like, man, this is the coolest thing ever. Cause I always used to listen to Joe, Joe Rogan's podcast. So, there was like 10 of them back then. Yeah, that was it, really. I mean, and then, um, so then, on top of that, there was a, um, oh man, what's his name? Uh, Green, um, the guy from Canada that used to be, he was, he's on been on some movies and stuff, but uh, Tom Tom Green. Yep. You know Tom Green? He used yes, to have, weird so guy. He, he was a skateboarder. Weird yeah. as hell, yes. And he used to have, he's, he lived in LA and he had, TV cameras and he would do a, 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 well, it wasn't a, it was a podcast, but it was almost like a TV show. Yeah. So I was like, man, that would be cool to do that. So I used to do a podcast every Tuesday afternoon from my house before everyone started doing podcasts. And I tried Why'd to like, you quit doing it. Well, cause I tried to you sell You would be it. a billionaire right Dude, now. Well, you know why? Because you know how much work it is when you're doing it yourself. It's a lot of work, oh, you know? God. And that, that was before you knew you could you could like buy all these things that made the podcast very easy you can you know well, I had my the microphones and all that stuff but all the video stuff and all the all the recording and whatever so yeah, that the equipment was not like readily as, as much as available as it is now. you had to use no, radio equipment at all you know Expensive. so that that was I, I mean the idea it was like it was I was like man this is going to be something this will be something people will like I think but then it became so much work like I would find myself once I you know, obviously I'd, I'd do it, but you, you'd have to spend at least two hours before you were going to do it that night to talk to people. But I had guy like I had Bob Avila on there one time and, um, you know, my buddy Warwick Schiller was on there. There's a few horse, like people that were close or whatever, but yeah, I just never, it, it, I tried to sell it to the PBR one time and be like, Hey, this is what we need to do. And they were like, nah, it's not going to work. And then, yeah. So anyway, how funny. Yeah. Like Endeavor 
Yeah. Face Joe Rogan. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Joe, Joe, Joe Rogan was the one that really was the reason why I thought about doing it. That you know? was early. I mean, but he, he even he talks about it. He's like, man, back when I was doing it, I was doing it in front. I had no idea it was going to make me hundreds and hundreds of millions. Millions of dollars. I know, yeah. It was like, it would have been the same thing for any rodeo type person who started to be the right. godfather of that. Yeah. Filthy rich. Yeah, and you know, I recorded, they used to have some video um, things like... Um, some programs that you could record it or whatever through on video and stuff. And we did, and now they're, I don't have, I don't even know where they would all be. I, I, I don't even know if they got saved or anything. It was, we'd be cool to go back and listen to some. You put them on Apple? No, I never did because back then no one knew how to, I didn't know how to what do that. What was it that. called? Uh, yeah. What was it called? If yes. it's still alive. Out well, it was called in, the Brendan Clark show is what I called it. If it's, it's still alive. Horse trainer. Yeah. That's yeah. A horse trainer thing. You name it after yourself. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty i feel like i'm pretty good <laughs> hey <laughs> so i don't mean look there. i'm on my phone right now yeah um so i just uh tried a two-year-old before i came here did they call um and they pre-purchased it so mm -hmm. my wife-to-be is she was pre-purchasing us but she never let me just i don't i'm not uh -oh. trying to be let's don't see do it uh all good so far but we're doing extra and then I get it. Now I've got a text saying, "Hey, babe, when are we done?" So for all the people out there listening, that's that's <laughs> like my next year is uh, <laughs> two year old. Well, my yeah. next year is three year old. That's what we're doing right. This is yeah. how it goes. Like right now, and and it's it's funny how things happen. Like I wasn't I wasn't really even well, was I was looking, but I wasn't really looking at the time. And I found I seen a guy riding one, and I'm like, man, I'll, um, guy named Kaylee Wilson was riding one around, and I thought he was. I was like, man, that horse looks pretty good. And yeah. then, yeah, so we, I was like, I better try it. see if I can try that one. Yeah. So we're pre-purchasing it right now. And for the people at home that don't really know what that means. So what we, I rode it and decided, and I liked it. So then we take it to the vet and have the vet x-ray it and. Do the vet check. Do yeah. the vet check. Yeah. So a lot of people might know what it is, but yeah, so it's exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. So maybe when I get off here or out of here, I'll find out that I may have another Horse for next year. Yeah, and then when we talk to you next year, then it'll have been a winner. It'll be Hopefully. a really good thing. Yeah, like, I remember like, that time? I bought I, that horse when I was in your yeah, studio. I like the way you think. Yeah. So, yeah. Positivity. Mm -hmm. Not Zane Davis way, but the positivity. Optimism. Yeah. The thing that he actually claims See, he hates yeah, is optimism. No, it's fine. We were talking a little bit about that before, but I'm... You know, I'm... I don't even know the terminologies or the names that they say about people like... like what, when you like that, but I've got to be very careful not to talk myself into not being positive. Like, I, maybe I didn't say that the right way. Like, no, I, I, think you I, did, yeah. I don't want to. Like, I've, I'm like, I've got to really think positive. I've got to be like, it'll work. It'll be fine. I'm everything's all good. But it, because if I start getting in my head saying, well, maybe it might not work and whatever, I know I feel like I learnt that from bull riding because like you can't be like second guessing yourself. No. And I always, I, I don't know if I joke with people, I always told people, I was like, that's like when I first started doing the cow horse, when I, when I was in the limited and that was back when the limited was truly just people that started. Mm -hmm. And then intermediate was for really good guys. And then the open was for the badasses. Well, I, I was like, because I was always a finals. I'm like, they don't want to let me get into the finals because I, I had, when it come to competition, not horse training. Let's not talk about horse training. But when it comes to competition, I'm going to kick your ass every time because I'm going to win. I, I because I've learned to win. Mm -hmm. So like I don't. When I go in there, I don't even think. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm. That it's going to go. Everything's going to go perfect. So that, that energy transfers to your horse, right? Well, I, I guess. I mean, I guess sometimes I feel like now because you, you know the more you win and the more you get better, you kind of it's hard to think like. But I truly always think like once. Hey, no matter how it feels before I walk in there. It's all gonna be good, and that was where I always joked like, I can. That's why I can. That's why I can beat people because once I get to the finals, we're all on a free. It's all <laughs> like, let's just go for it. Right. And you know, as we all know, most of the time it doesn't work, but I still think it's going to. <laughs> yeah, but I think positive self talk is something that can carry you through your entire life and I, help you accomplish most of your goals. That and having the discipline to actually act on that self-talk. Absolutely. Because people get addicted to self-help. That's like a thing now. I've mm -hmm. almost, it's almost happened to me where I get like, I like to read books. Well, I read them, but I listen to them. Yep, me too. A shit ton of books. And I'm like, I am like, wow, I have read like 14 self-help books. 
holy shit, I've implemented zero things yep. from these books. So I'm addicted to the idea of self-help, but not yep. actually helping myself. Yeah. And we are careful with you, self-talk. Too. Right. And yeah, well, so, I mean, sometimes it gets to the point where you end up like, man, well, I start talking badly about myself again. Oh, what if, you know, like, yep. and, and that's easy to get into. And I'm that person. Like I, I think some people are like, eh, well, you know, they're just laid back and they just, whatever, it's fine. And, Maybe maybe they're not. Maybe they just disguise it better than we do. But I've got to be very careful about that. Yeah. Because I want to, you know, like I've got to just be, you know, I do. I, I'll I'll read it, listen or read to a self help book real quick. But you know, you're right. There comes a time when you just keep reading them and there's like nothing. You're like, well, I'm still the same person. Like I haven't even done anything about it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like you almost you can get some good ideas from them, but. You use them as a copy. I mean, I have. When things have gone bad, I start downloading books and I right. start listening to them. And then, you know, I've now I'm, I feel good. I'm like, wow, I spent 15 freaking hours on that book. I got through it in three days, two days. I spent too much time on a pickup apparently, but got through it. And now I don't know what to do. Right. And then I started, nothing happens. I see, like, I'm not much of a reader. I like, I, I read, but I, I don't. I don't get into books like some people are really good readers. I, I like listening to podcasts, but I, I did start. I went, I took my son to the bookstore the other day. We go there and finding books, you know, so he can read. And um, so I bought a book. It was like um, the art. You've probably read it, but you know, it's uh, the art of not giving a fuck. The subtle art of not, subtle giving, art of not fuck. giving a fuck. So that like was like five times. Yeah. Right. And then there's a sequel to it and the sequel's even like higher level. But yeah, that guy's name is Mark Manson. Yeah. He's like a really grounded thinker and he's not like some highly educated guy dropped out of college, traveled the world, like went through some shit and then he decided to write this book and yeah, it's a great book. But did you read that book and be like, Oh fuck. That's, yeah, that's, that's happened. That's me. Yeah, well, yeah, I think like that. And then, yeah, yeah, like you just after one after another, it's pretty simple, but it's like, well, uh, I don't need to think like that. I just need to not. Yeah, I mean, care. that. I mean, there's a reason that like two million people have bought that book. Yeah, I mean, I've literally, it's on my, I probably try to read that book at least twice a year. That's a good yeah. book. I, like I listen to it. I don't read because I fall yeah. asleep. And well, that's, yeah. I listen to them. Well, I've, I've decided, I, I've decided that I um, might want to read a little bit more, so I have been reading it. But yeah, that's like kind of cool. Is this I, the first time you read that? Yeah, book? first time. I are read you it. through it, or are you just? No, I'm not through it all the way yet. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm. I actually I bought it here, but because of like by the time I get back to the room now, I'm like there is no reading because I'll be asleep in three seconds. So yeah, yeah, that's, no, I, that's a good one. It makes you it kind of what I find myself going. Oh, oh, man, I feel good. I'm gonna go sleep now. Like it's like. You kind of like not so. It helps. It's like, man, I shouldn't worry about everything. You know, that's, and I, I think at the end of the day, that's kind of how it's got to be. You got to be like not so worried about things. I think we stress about a lot of things that we can't control. And I'm bad for that. Yeah. You know, like whether it be horse training or whatever, my past life, whatever, or, you know, think it's like, oh man, I can't, you know, that's nothing. I can't control that. I just got to, and I'm honestly, I don't deal with it very good because I'm not that person, like I said, but I've got to, I'm trying to get better at it. It's like, you know what? I can't control. And you know what? If you don't, if I walk out of here and you don't like me, that's not my problem. That's your problem. I can't control that. No, no. So that's the way I started. I'm trying to think about things now. I'm like, if something happens and this person thinks something, about, if they don't really know me, and they haven't gone out of their way to be like, get to know me or whatever, but they don't like me for some in particular reason or the way I view something or the way I think something or maybe the way I said something to them, or then that's not my fault. No. That's their fault. Like, that's their problem. Getting to that point, I mean, because we're, we're just in such a, a society where we're fixated on everybody's opinions, like, it's really hard and tools like... Once you re- once you finish the subtle art of not giving a fuck, you gotta, you gotta read Everything is Fucked, a book about hope. It's the sequel. Right, I... That's the next one. Read okay. that one next. It's a little higher level, but right. you got to read them both. Right. Eh? Yeah. I'm going to do that yeah. when I get to it and then I'll tell you about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, cause th- those books help. It really helped me a lot just yeah. to not, cause I was that guy. Like I just, I cared more about the perception people have me than actually the person I was for a long time. Right. And that is not good. That yeah, is, no, that you're right. And quick that, and way that, to unhappiness. That goes back to what we were talking about before, really about, I mean, you know, you, we street we do stress over people's opinions and the way that they view us and the way that you know everything and it's like man we 
that isn't really our – that's not our problem. That's not my – I shouldn't have to think about that because I've got so much that I need to take – I'm taking on already myself that I really – like just, just come over and, you know, bullshit me for a while and hang out and we'll, we'll, whatever. I mean, it will, you'll find – I mean, you'll really find out that I don't care about anything else, not, not in a bad way. I'm just trying to get through my life <laughs> without having to deal with – all of your problems too, you know what I mean? So, you know, like, and that's, I think that comes back to what we were talking about with, you know, like with the business and stuff like that. And I, I, I don't, again, I didn't want any of that to come across in the wrong way, but it's like, I think sometimes when you really think of that, like, how are you doing, man? Like that, that's a pretty good, that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to do to somebody. That you might not be the best friends with, but you're like, I, I, how you can tell when someone's having a bit of a bad day, right? Yeah, and like, sometimes you gotta you gotta go. How are you doing? Like oh, that typical answer. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, like, but no, 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 no. How, how are you? How are you doing, doing? buddy? You, oh, is everything okay? Like you. So I think that goes a long way, and I think we don't do that enough. And I'm trying to get better at that. Like if like you know, and anyway, especially if you're a rodeo cowboy or a freaking horse trainer or a cowboy or whatever or a hard ass, you're not going to be like, yeah, you know what, I'm having a bad day. This has happened and this person said this to me and didn't make me feel better. No one's going to do that. But I think, but I do feel like sometimes we need it. We do. We have to, we have to go somewhere with that energy. And, you know, it, it's funny if like you get into thinking about things, it's like the number one life skill that we could have is, is to be a good listener. And it's so hard. Oh. If you can just practice that, like... I'm a terrible listener. Uh, we all are, because yeah. we love the sound of our own fucking voices. Yeah. We're pre-programmed to like the sound of our own voices, and we all want to be heard because we live in this society where whoever screams the loudest gets the most attention, which we're all craving for, and you're supposed to get rid of that because that's a terrible character trait. Attention-seeking is a bad character trait. I know that because I had to get rid of that. But Do you... If you, so if you, if you work on your, just listening... You're so much better off. Listen more than you talk. It's so hard to do, but if you can do that, you're just you're gonna be a better person. Like I'm, I, I, I am a terrible listener, and you know what? I don't think I'm a terrible listener, but I think my mind's always thinking about something else that I'm thinking. Like th not not that I'm trying to be ignorant. Like I'm fine now because we're just talking back and forth. But if I'm thinking about something else, there'll be times when I'm like not really listening, and like that's bad. It's real bad because. That person might really need you, but it's right. not you. It's everybody, right. Right? and it's happened to you. And, I, and I, you've talked to somebody, and you can see that they're they're thinking about something else, and it's just like, damn. And that's the reason I'm saying it is because, yeah. like, it, yeah, like we're all a culprit of it. But it's like, man, it's 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 like some someone might need to get something off their chest, and it might not even be anything bad. But I think we, you know, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is striving to be a better person or better something. Is, yeah. is a good thing, you know? Like, I mean, whether it be, we all, and I, I've, how am I going to try? But we all get so caught up, and I've come right around, but we get so caught up on our identity or whatever it is we do for a living is the thing that we're, that's what, it, that's what everyone, like, that's what defines us. Yeah, yeah, defines us and what, but then at the end of the day, like, I, I, I said, you know, you, again, well, let's just talk about, um, Gary Gonzalez, double G, you know, I read some of the comments like on, you know, the poor, you know, God rest his soul, but you, you read the comments and it's like, yeah, he was a great horse trainer. He's a great whatever, but you don't typically, and I'm not saying this is him, just as whatever, but in, in fact, you don't always hear that someone goes, that was such a great guy. You don't see 150,000 comments on man, great guy, great guy, great guy, blah, blah, blah. Helped me when I, needed help or what you, you'll always come back to what your identity is right yep. and your identity is whether it be you you're you're whether you want it or not your identity and same with me your identity is this yep but it's not what defines you like you're not there you you have so much more to offer number one so much more that you love number two and you in your this is just a part of what you do you're not trying you're not You've you've changed people's lives because of this, but I'm a sure I'm sure there's so much more. I don't even know you very well. I I, I feel like I do because I listen to this podcast. But you're so much more of a person. You've changed people's lives in other way that you don't even know or think about. And that's the truth. That's what people. That's what I'm I'm trying to get to is like we 
we all are so caught up in, and I try not to be like, you know what, I'm a, I, I, yes, I'm a, I, I was a great bull rider and I'm a great horse trainer. But at the end of the day, we all drive out of Fort White. We're leaving here on Sunday morning and we're all the same. Yep. We're, we're, yeah, we're all still horse trainers and whatever, but we're all still human beings and we're yeah, all still Take people. it a step further. Everybody who's in traffic with you who isn't in a truck and a trailer, they're the same. They're the same too. too. We're all just going on to live our lives. And that's what's important, I think, over everything we do. You just live your life. You got to try and live your life to be um, a oh, perfect example. When, when I heard about Robert Chown having his cancer scare, I was like, I was gutted. I'm like, no way. No way. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, how could, I mean, he's fine. And he's now everything. But but when it's someone, but it was like, man, that's someone that's close enough to, I wouldn't say we're best friends, but we're freaking stalled together for the last six years and we've worked together doing TV and we've been friends and we're bullshit. We're close enough. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, man, like a reality. You know what? At the end of the day, does all this other bullshit that we're doing really matter? No, it doesn't. Because that's what really matters. Are you like my friends, man? Are you, are you okay? Like, shit. I'm sorry to hear it, but I'm here if you need me. You know, like, I'm, there's between where I live and where he lives, there's three million, oh, more than that, people that can help him. Right. But that doesn't mean shit. You know, like you gotta. But like what I'm saying is, is the world life is too short. So short. And you've got to try and touch the people you can touch and help them the way you can. And that goes back to what you're saying about the kids and setting an example and whatever. and Leave something for the next guy. And be happy. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's that's the best message. Horse trainer or politician or we've had UFC fighter. It doesn't even matter who it is or just guy walking down the street. Like, yep. just think about somebody else. Absolutely. For five freaking minutes. Think I'm, about someone other than yourself. And absolutely. it changes the world. Yeah. Grassroots. And you know what's crazy about it? It makes you feel damn good about yourself. Is what we're all. It's what we're from. called to do. Yeah. Like I don't know if you're a religious person or not, but you you don't have to be a Christian to know that. Like if you just look through all the ancient texts, Bible included, yep. it's all by neighbor before thyself. You know. Yeah. Everybody before you. Yep. Put other people's needs or emotions before yours, and that's going to fulfill your shit. Which is crazy because that's exactly what I just said. But yes, and I grew is. up Catholic. And I'm not a religious guy as in like I don't probably be as much as I should be. I do it in my own way. Yeah. But I guess that's exactly what I just said and it's true. It and, and I mean, man, they've been preaching it to us for millions of years, you know. So it's crazy. I mean, and honestly, like I said, it goes back with, with you know, trying to change professions and having lull moments and, you know, moments of depression and all. Like at the end of the day – I still get mad about things and I still am not perfect, but I try, I just try and be like, man, let's try and be happy, you know, try and smile and talk to everyone and be, yeah. that's, that's it that, because you really, thing. you know, like I remember, you know, like it goes back to, I remember, you know, when you're a young guy and you look up to sports people and your first time you meet us, you ever remember the first time you met the, the a famous sports person? Yeah, that, you I know? can remember it as non-rodeo sports person. Yeah, I remember it. Yep. Like it was yesterday. I remember when I first met my first sports person and, and I was standing outside the locker room of a rugby team that was our local rugby team and, and he walked out and he stopped and started talking and he talked to me and signed an autograph for me. I'll never forget that day. See, mine's very similar, but it's the opposite. So I didn't give a shit about this sport. It was golf. But for some reason, I got talked up like liking the golfer Phil Mickelson yeah. for some reason because yep. he was a little edgy maybe. And I don't remember how I got there, but somehow I went to some golf tournament. And I, don't, I really couldn't care less about golf. But I thought Phil Mickelson was cool, maybe because he was left-handed and I was left-handed. Yep. And I had a Wheaties box that had him on it. And I don't know why, but we were at this golf tournament. And I, he walked right by me and I said, Phil Mickelson, will you please sign this? And he said, nope, I'm playing. And it shook me yep. to the core. Mm -hmm. And you've never forgot it. Never forgot that. Don't, I mean, maybe there's some internal thing that cares, but, you know, like that taste of rejection. Yep. It did. It stuck for a long time. Yep. Yeah, and probably affected me in a lot of ways. I'm sure there was other rejections, but that, you know, that's, it is. Those yeah. formative things change you. 
And it's, it's, it goes to the same thing of like, you never know who's watching you do what you're doing. And I've been a culprit of this and I'm not perfect and I'm not saying I've never done it, but I always try to be mindful of it. And, you know, like you just never know, like a little kid might be sitting there watching you do something and you don't realize that he is, you know? And so trying, you know, to do that and do the best you can or, or be a good example is a tough thing to do. Yeah. You Sometimes know? it's, it's not being perfect. It's just the effort that counts. But right. One thing that I've, I've, Realize, I think you and I could talk endlessly. We we could probably rift on this deep stuff forever, and I and I I love that because that means when we do another show, we can do another show, and and we can almost pick up where we left off. But this is this has been so amazing, yeah. and uh, I'm glad you came and just a fantastic message, I think. And, and so thank you for that. And well, I have, appreciate it. You have very unique experiences in two very different areas that we touch on all the time. Well, thank you. you. Know, yeah. I've, um, and and well, it's, it's been really awesome. Well, I appreciate it. I, I've been a big fan of the show. And when I got the call to you guys offering me to come on here, I, I really, really appreciate it. So hopefully we can do it again. We will do it again for sure. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think, like I said, we never know who's going to hear it or why, but this one has so much good so we did a good thing thank you this has been the gauge hosted by me chance conrado produced and edited by our guy ty yeager shout out to the executive producers dustin pointer and cody denton marketing and content produced by riley chone Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gauge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gauge wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.